Hi everyone, Gabriel Mercer here. Welcome to this brand new presentation entitled Indie Authors, How to Hitch Your Digital Marketing to Your Bottom Line. Do you ever wonder if and when you'll sell enough books to make back the money you spent creating them in the first place? Are you curious about how some authors are able to speak confidently about their return on investment? And why is it that some writers can easily justify the use of social media while others are never quite sure if their time is being well spent? After more than a decade of helping businesses adapt and grow in the digital age, I found a key difference that separates stalled or failing companies from successful ones. Systems. Peter Drucker said, what gets measured, gets managed. And he's largely considered to be the founder of modern management. Problems are going to arise in every business, even creative ones. We won't always have enough data to make an informed decision. And these problems often stem from the same core issues over and over again. To answer this, we keep doing what we've always done. And in most cases, we trust our intuition to carry us through. Now that's fine when you're a team of one. But what got you here might not get you there. And we're all looking to get to the next level. For most independent authors, getting to a finished product requires the work of several professionals across a variety of disciplines. Editorial, design, technology, marketing, all of those add up to a high quality book. To keep everyone moving in the same direction, you need one version of the truth. A dashboard that measures performance before, during, and after every project. A touchstone that's always pointed towards your goals, even when everything else has gone sideways. So that when, not if, problems arise, you're not forced to make snap decisions, blindly guess, or rely on old standbys. You'll have clarity around the issues so that you aren't repeating the same mistakes that are holding you back. Instead of constantly putting out the same fires, you can focus on optimizing what you have and building to that next level. You'll be prepared. In this presentation, you're going to discover the systems and tools for creating a publishing business with results you can measure. This is going to immediately help you track the progress you've made with your books. And once you get this down, you'll start experiencing the confidence that comes from using trusted business principles. So if you're an indie author and you aren't sure what makes up a sustainable business in book publishing, stay with me. You're going to discover how successful businesses like yours can grow and thrive and why it's critical that you get data-driven systems put in place right now. The goal of this presentation is simple, to help you easily identify if your numbers are aligned with your vision. Plus, I'm going to show you ways to reclaim a portion of your royalties so that you can get the most out of every title every time, and a way to figure out which marketing activities are producing sales, not just shares, comments, likes, and favorites. The more you can systematize your marketing, the greater the opportunity you'll have to create a lasting income. Are you ready to make this happen? Let's get started. Publishing financials. The purpose of any financial statement is to help you quickly determine the health of your business currently so that you can make actionable decisions about the future. If you want a stable income from your books, your first priority should be getting a handle on how money is moving through your business, both in and out. If the big objective is to measure how different activities impact your bottom line, First, you have to know what your bottom line is. For anyone curious, bottom line is a widely used term for the calculation of revenue minus costs. In simpler terms, it's all the money you take in, less everything you spent. And that gives you your bottom line. Incidentally, the term bottom line comes from where you put that final total on your income statement. Now to do the math, we use a tool called a P&L. This might also be referred to as a P&L, a profit and loss statement, or as I said earlier, an income statement. At the most basic level, your P&L helps you calculate profits for a set period of time. We'll define profit as any extra revenue after you've subtracted your expenses. So here's how that calculation works, and it's much simpler than you'd imagine. You decide on a time frame. Most companies use one year. Keep in mind, it may take several years for even a single book to be profitable. Now this is a living document, so you or your bookkeeper will want to add your actual numbers every month to see if they match your predictions. Okay, so take a spreadsheet, 
and create two columns. Column A is a list of activities that will either produce revenue or incur expenses. Make sure to track everything that goes into producing your books. Editorial, creative, marketing, technology, and even your overhead if you have a home office. Column B is used to record the money that the company receives or pays based on the activities in column A. If you total everything at the bottom of column B, you'll know whether or not your book is profitable, whether or not you have any extra money after you've paid all your expenses. That's it. I'd also suggest duplicating column B for each edition of a given title. So you would have a set of numbers for your digital edition, your hardcover edition, your softcover edition, an audio edition in each of their respective languages. Now, if you need a template to get started, I'd suggest this one from Jane Friedman. She also did an excellent write-up about how traditional publishing houses use a P&L to determine the advance for new authors. When trying to project sales, most of my clients use a yearly volume somewhere between two and 10,000 units, depending on the title's category, format, length, and their list size. You'll have to use your best judgment to decide what's realistic for your books. Just remember that most distributors only make royalty payments once a quarter, sometimes twice a year. Once you've finished the P&Ls for your books, you can choose to spend against future earnings or only use the money that's generated through book sales. Now, big disclaimer here, forecasted numbers are just a guess. There are no guarantees in publishing or in any business for that matter. So please don't borrow or spend money that you can't afford to lose. However you choose to invest in your publishing business, you now have a way to measure risk versus reward when making financial decisions. That's what a P&L is going to do for you. A profit and loss statement for each of your books is the perfect first step toward building a stable income. Next up, we'll talk about maximizing your revenue per book by following a simple process for setting up an affiliate account so that you can reclaim some of your royalties from distributors. If that sounds complicated, just stick with me. Anytime you're trying to build a business, it's inevitable you'll hit roadblocks. Maybe you've even experienced them before. Things like heavy time constraints, technical complexity, and information overwhelm. Here's what I know. If you've ever faced these before, it's totally normal. But if you allow these to become your everyday truth, you'll never achieve the level of success you're after. And as an independent author, there are a lot of moving parts. You're responsible for the product, the marketing, and the operation. In a publishing company, those would be entirely separate jobs that all earned a full salary. You've got to rely on whatever skills and resources you bring to the table. So if this is a new venture for you, there's probably times when you wonder how anyone gets anything done. That's why in the next two sections, I'm going to take you through the process of maximizing your marketing returns and break it all down. We're going to get very practical about tracking, which is going to save you a lot of frustration when trying to build your campaigns and put real numbers in your P&L. Before we go any further, it's important I bring your attention to something that often gets overlooked as you begin to think about this from a business perspective. Not paying attention to this will virtually guarantee that you continue to struggle with your return on investment. Please don't open an affiliate account until you have at least one title that is selling, preferably three or more. Those can be standalone or in a series. Tracking content, advertising, and sales does absolutely no good if you don't have a winning product in the marketplace. It can be difficult as creators to take a step back and evaluate our own work. So use feedback from developmental or substantive editors, beta readers, critique partners, and even your friends and family. Try to reach a point where a small number of people love what you're producing, then promote it. No amount of marketing will help you achieve product market fit, even if it's part of a well-oiled machine. Your book has to meet the demands of your audience. Now, if you've already got books that are doing well, then this will help them do even better. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of our royalty section, starting with Amazon Associates. I'm only going to cover this one affiliate program to illustrate the topic. The good news is they all operate the same way. Every other major retailer has an affiliate program except for Google Play, and that may change by the time you watch this presentation. So what is an affiliate program? Well, product creators aren't always experts at marketing and sales. They've spent so much time honing their craft or growing their expertise 
that it didn't leave them time to study anything else. Sound familiar? In the same way publishers emerge to help authors with the business of books, affiliate marketers are people that specialize in getting the attention of a target audience. An affiliate program is a way that product creators and marketers can work together so that each party can benefit from the other's best work. As a product creator, you offer a sales commission for every customer that an affiliate brings to you. As an affiliate, you recommend products to your audience in exchange for a percentage of the sales. In the case of Amazon Associates, I'm going to show you how to be an affiliate marketer for Amazon. It just so happens that the product we're trying to sell is our own. The practice is not only allowed, it's encouraged. Amazon offers a small percentage for any customer that purchases using your affiliate code within 24 hours. A great example of this are book reviewers. So let's say you find a new book on NetGalley. You read it and then you post a review on your blog. Within that post, you're probably going to include a link to buy the book on Amazon. The link you're sharing is most likely going to be an affiliate link. Every person that buys a copy of that book within 24 hours using your link will count as a sale for you. Every sale you refer earns you a small percentage of whatever was purchased. Now, Amazon doesn't offer a very large commission because they don't need to. Most people are going to buy direct anyway but it's still worth it for them to introduce new customers into the Amazon ecosystem, so you might still earn anywhere from 4 to 8% per transaction. This is great for authors because this is an easy way to reduce your distribution fee of 30% if you're in the $2.99 to $9.99 price tier, down to 26 or even 22% on all direct sales. On a $3.99 or $0.99 book, that could be the difference of up to $0.32 cents per copy. Over 10,000 copies, that's $3,200 that you might be leaving on the table. Now here's the best part. The account itself is free, and you're already doing the work to earn your commission. It's just marketing your own book. And there's an added advantage as well. Because you're using an affiliate link to track sales, you now have visibility into which of your ads or content are performing best in terms of revenue. Using a unique affiliate link for each campaign can tell you what's driving the sales of your book and not just the clicks. This is critical because advertising platforms like Facebook consider their job finished once they've served your ad and someone clicks the link. After that, your budget is deducted and you're on your own. Platforms like Facebook are always striving for the click because that's their business model. But as the author, you only make money when your book is sold. Only an affiliate account lets you track Amazon's shopping cart to make sure readers are actually purchasing. Here's how that looks. Now finally, and possibly most importantly, I'm going to show you how to track links using what's called a UTM parameter. They're a free and easy way to determine the results of what you share online. UTM parameters let you measure the effectiveness of any link you post or give to someone to post for you. So even if you're just an aspiring author, this will get you on track to build a following by sticking with activities that bring the most value. And if you're already established, then we're going to discuss specific steps you can take right now to amplify your best marketing and identify the few things that are likely holding you back. Let's look at the facts. Every year, there are people just like you topping the bestseller charts. In fact, there are more people today making a living with books than ever before. With the amount of information, tools, and resources, it's never been simpler. I didn't say it was easy, I said it's never been simpler. But that's why now is such a great time to be thinking about your platform and committing to building an income with your books. Imagine how it'll feel to finally know that you're building a stable business with independent publishing. Okay, have you ever heard of dark social traffic? It's the people who find your website through links that can't be tracked for referrals. Most of it comes through things like email and instant messages. According to research from 33 Across, 82% of online sharing happens by copy-paste. And that might be why you see such a large number in the direct source of your analytics platform. Now, it's not a perfect solution, but there is a method we can use to help shed some light on dark social traffic. It's called an urchin tracking module or a UTM parameter. Urchin Software was the analytics company that Google acquired in 2005 that would later become Google Analytics. So what exactly is a UTM parameter then? 
It's that crazy string of text that you see at the end of a link. The original URL often stops after the last forward slash. The added bits are the information that we use for tracking. Now for you to use them as an author, all you need is Google Analytics and the Google UTM Builder. They're both free tools and take about five minutes to get set up for your website. If you're not sure if you have Google Analytics or you need to get set up, visit this site. The very first link is Get Started with Analytics and it'll walk you through the install process. If you're a visual learner, a quick YouTube search returned more than 120,000 videos for the search term, How to Install Google Analytics. For the purposes of this presentation and out of respect for your time, I'm going to assume you have Google Analytics installed and focus on the best practices for building links with UTM parameters. So let's jump over to the UTM Builder. What you've probably already noticed is that it's just a web form with six fields and only two of them are required. There's even a brief explanation about how to use each of them. To save you some time and add a little color to the instruction manual, I'm going to explain each of the parameters and how to use them. So first up is the campaign source. Source is the place where you share the link. Maybe it's your email newsletter, a featured deal site, or even Facebook. Wherever you originally shared the content, that's the source of your traffic for this link. Second is campaign medium. Medium is the way you shared the link. On Facebook, it might be a post or a video. On a featured deal site, it might have been a website banner or an email they sent. Whatever the reader was prompted to click or tap on, that's the medium for this link. Third is the campaign name. Name is the reason you're sharing the link. The video on Facebook might be part of a lead generation campaign. Maybe it's a creative journal entry on your blog that's purely for engagement. Whatever the reason, that's how you should name the campaign. In the event that you're making more than one offer in the same campaign, I would strongly suggest naming this link after the entry point or the first conversion in that sequence. That way you don't get anything confused if you have several different offers all leading to the same book or series. Next is campaign term. If you're running any kind of keyword advertising, this is your target keyword phrase. In the event you're using display advertising like Facebook ads, you should add the audience targeting that you've chosen. This can be interests, demographics, psychographics, or any combination of characteristics that you've labeled inside the advertising platform. Now, if you're not advertising with this link, you can skip this field entirely. Finally, we have campaign content. This field is used primarily for split testing different links. So let's say you send an email out to your newsletter and you've included a call to action to pre-order your newest release. Now, if you're following best practices, you'll have at least three links in the same email, all leading to the same destination page. Using the content field helps you identify which of the links is being clicked on the most within that message. The alternative would be creating three versions of the same web page so that you could measure the traffic to each one separately. Campaign content is also optional if you're not testing variations of the same call to action. So here's a look at what a finished link with UTM parameters might look like. Now that you know how to create a link with UTM parameters, let's talk about some of the best practices. Here's a quick list of things to make using these links as simple as possible. Number one, try not to use the same label across multiple fields. If your source and content are both email, consider making the source newsletter or mailing list to keep things clear. Number two, you'll notice when I wrote mailing list, I used a dash and not an underscore as the space between the words. UTM parameters are still part of your URLs, which means they are subject to SEO or search engine optimization rules. Since you can't use spaces, search algorithms like dashes better than underscores, especially Google. Number three, keep it simple. Short descriptors will keep your parameters manageable and will make it easier for you to analyze the results after a promotion has ended. At this point, I would also recommend you use a spreadsheet to track all of the links you've created using UTM parameters. This creates a consistent record for you to look over if you ever need to know how you labeled an earlier link. Now, if you're completely burnt out on spreadsheets after the PL content, Rafflecopter has done the heavy lifting for you you can grab a copy of their tracking sheet right here. 
And that's it. You can immediately start using UTM parameters for the links in your email messages, social media posts, and your advertising campaigns. Now, you might be wondering, what if someone grabs the original URL and just ditches all the UTM parameters I made? Well, it does happen. As I mentioned earlier, this isn't a perfect solution to all your dark social traffic. However, there is a way to help mitigate the problem of people cleaning URLs. The primary reason people do that is because the links are just too long. To solve this, I recommend using a link shortener. Google has one that will take this big string of text and convert it into an easily shareable Google link. My personal preference is a service called Bitly, and that's only because I started using it before Google introduced their link shortener. Link shorteners are another one of those things that all function the same way. While we're on the subject, here's a bonus tip for sticking with me this long. One solution that I've recommended to a number of my clients is a free WordPress plugin called PrettyLink. If you own your own domain and you're on a self-hosted WordPress install, PrettyLink will let you create masked links that use your domain name. This is great for branding or for permanent redirects when you don't have a uniform naming convention on all of your social media profiles. And the best part is, it's free. So if your Facebook page is Facebook slash first name, last name, dot author, and your Twitter handle is first initial, last initial, dot right, and your YouTube channel is the real dot last name, dot first name, you can create redirects that look more like this. While not necessarily a tracking strategy, it's a great way to make your links more memorable and shareable. As authors, time is the most valuable resource we have. So I can understand why you might be wondering if you have enough time to fully participate in building these systems and getting everything you possibly can out of them. The good news is, once you have them established, the upkeep is minimal. So you're able to fit them in whenever it's most convenient for you. They'll start to become a habit. As far as the actual time it will take to initially build these out, that really depends on you. How quickly you manage this will vary from person to person and catalog to catalog. The key is that you intentionally schedule time on your calendar and dedicate that time specifically to the growth of your business. My hope is the information we've covered here today will help you design a system that works for you and your books. A system that brings you one step closer to a profitable catalog and a thriving business. And if you have any questions about this presentation or anything else to do with independent publishing, you can find me at GM Writes on Twitter or gm at gabrielmercer.com. Thanks for watching.